All right, so I think we're going to get started. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so my name is Christopher Liu. I'm the associate curator at the Whitney Museum. Um, and here we're going to be speaking about um, new art, so really about what young artists are thinking about today, kind of looking at the big picture of you know, what are the conditions that we live in right now and what are the things that artists are thinking about. And you know, certainly we can't bring an entire generation of artists into this room from around the world to do that. Um, so we have um, two artists with us today that will speak about what they are doing in particular. And I think through that, we'll be able to extrapolate a little bit about what we may be seeing down the line or in the very near future. Um, and before I formally introduce Iveria and Rachel, um, just wanted to give a little bit of framework um, for what we'll talk about and also how we'll think about um, the work of these particular artists. And I think having this panel come towards the end of Kent Presents is kind of useful since so much of what we've all been listening to and really discussing throughout all these panels is really relevant in both direct and indirect ways um, to what I think artists are absorbing and kind of processing. And that is, to put it in very reductive um, terms, on one side we have ideas around technology, um, you know, the huge advancements in technology and in medicine and in communications that on one side seems like we're entering into this new era that through all of these means and these kind of new ideas and new forms that they will, act, will seem to save the world or introduce us into a new world or at the very least disrupt the world that we know today. And on the other side, we have um, kind of these darker, seemingly catastrophic things where between climate change and ecological devastation, so various types of unrest and inequality um, and volatility that we seem to be at a certain end of times that you know, within the next generation or so, we may not know the world that we live in anymore. And so between these two things, how, how does an artist, especially a young artist, grapple with that and make work, continue to make artwork? And I would also say, like, it, does that matter? Should artists really take up this mantle that is also so important within, say, politics and society and, and all these very direct ways to um, address both the good and the bad that we have right now? And so with that, um, happy to introduce Rachel Rose. Um, I'm not going to get too far into the bio since you have all of that in your program. Um, Rachel has a number of really exciting exhibitions coming up. Um, one of which I'm super excited for as we'll be working together on a solo project this fall at the Whitney Museum, um, including and other exhibitions also at the Serpentine and also at the Aspen Art Museum um, in the year to come. And Zyveria Simmons will be presenting after her. Um, Zyveria and I um, were, um, had the pleasure of working together, especially on Greater New York 2010, which was co-organized by Klaus Biesenbach, who we have in the room today, um, and also a number of other performances as well. And I had the pleasure of seeing Zavira's huge um, installation at the Perez Art Museum in Miami, which is currently on view. So if anyone is headed down there, please check it out. And she also has a big exhibition that will take the entire um, gallery and theater of The Kitchen in New York. And that's coming in 2016. Rachel? OK. Um, so. Um, so I'm going to start and just say a few things about how I work in general, and then I'll do a quick overview of a few works I have done, and then briefly talk about the work that Chris and I are putting together for the Whitney show. So I work very slowly, and I work in video. Um, each work usually takes about a year to develop, and it starts within a stage of research and um, almost as though I'm an academic or a writer going to the library and, and not really being concerned with what I'm going to make, more exploring some, something that I'm curious about. Um, and then that evolves into working with sites that I'm interested in kind of grounding that research. Uh, so traveling, beginning to shoot and film, getting rights to film at those sites and so forth. And then the third stage is really the process of editing and putting the work together. And I kind of think that the work for me becomes really alive in the edit. It's um, in some ways a timeline in the program I use Adobe Premiere can come to look like a series of words in a kind of sentence or at other times like a drawing. Um, 
So I spend many months just within the state of editing and really learning in some ways what the initial research and what the traveling and the filming, um, more deeply what that was about. So um, usually my work start with a very subtle emotion or something that's just kind of in the back of my head that I can't get out, that just keeps coming up, just walking down the street, something very basic in a sense. Um, so the first work I made that was in this form of video was a work called Sitting, Feeding, Sleeping. And this came from basically a, a sense of depression in relationship to technology and feeling internally a sense of flatness, um, maybe that I was reacting to from being surrounded by technology at all times. And so I shot this work in a cryogenics lab in Arizona in a robotics perception lab in San Diego, which is what that image is from, and in zoos across the country. And the work became a method for drawing these three seemingly disparate sites together, um, connecting them around this feeling of, of flatness or um, liminal state between life and death. Um, so that's the, that's the first video work that I made. I, the screen on the thing isn't on, uh, so I can't see, but okay. What's that? Oh. You can see it. I can't, uh, I don't have my contacts on, I can't see. Um, <laughs> the next, okay. Anyway, so yeah. The next work I made um, was an inversion of the process that I worked with on the first. In the first, it was using many cameras, traveling these wide distances, disparate sites, bringing them together into a kind of internal emotion. In the second work, I really wanted to look at a very seemingly banal, everyday, singular site and see that if you just spend some time with that site, all the histories and scales of time and human experiences and non-human experiences, what had happened within that one place, how that place could be a container for that. And in a sense, the work became a kind of excavation of that one, of that one place. So I shot it in a place called Palisades, uh, which is across from the George Washington Bridge in New York. And it's a 200 million year old cliff. And on top sits this very small 18th cent or 19th century park. Um, and park design in America especially, there's a courses through the, the history of um, narrative and film and in the novel. And so I was also interested in this link as someone working in new forms of narrative, looking at how narrative is inscribed within a kind of landscape. So rather than working with many different cameras, for this one I shot it with a remote control rig. So the shots very intentionally go from far away to super close up, and you experience all the transitional space in between. In a sense, a kind of analogy for how we might experience time or history, um, seeing something from far away as a metaphor to then coming close to it and experiencing it maybe not even as an idea, more as a pure sensual material. So um, we can show a clip, just one minute of that work. Uh, do, you, do I have to switch the slide? Since we're running low on time, so I'll. You have a couple minutes. Okay, I have a couple minutes. Um, I'll. Uh, okay. So the next work I um, 
the, the feeling in the next work was really a total unease and anxiety about global warming and catastrophe to do with the weather. And I just couldn't get out of my head. But I also felt some conflict about approaching it as an artist because I really didn't want to deal with it politically or morally. Um, I was much more interested in looking at it, I guess, structurally in relationship to my own very personal unease and anxiety that is maybe also my own projection. Um, and I really didn't know where I was going to shoot it or what this would materialize. So I started with something very basic, just thinking about a very everyday boundary between myself and the outside, um, which is a window, something like glass. And that led me into a kind of research into the history of glass production in America and um, glass architecture in New York City, which is where I live, which led me to the international style, which led me to the glass house, um, Philip Johnson's. Uh, oh, I should switch the, sorry, these are from the other one. Okay, which led me to the glass house in Connecticut. Um, and the work became very much about using this symbol of both fragility and vulnerability, but also in a way a building that was a roadmap to so many ways that steel and glass have now been used in um, much of our architectural landscape um, as a way to think about my own unease about um, the weather and catastrophe. So I can show you a clip from that. So that leads me, uh, and this was a work I made a year ago, so now I've been working on um, the next work for the show with Chris. Um, and that, uh, okay. Um, so the next work um, comes, I'll say very briefly, because I don't want to take up much more time, but comes from partially being surrounded by so many new films about outer space and so many films using really inspiring forms of visual effects and new technologies with camera and light to express this external reality, maybe the most external that we can go. And I felt, once again, like I wanted to approach this subject of what it's like to be in infinite space, but to approach it not from the language of these technologies that are in place within the larger Hollywood landscape, but again within very finite, in a way basic means that I myself had control over. Um, looking at things like water, like dye, um, and in this work I, in, I interviewed an astronaut about his experience of his body in outer space, which is itself a very, in a way, a basic thing. It's just a person's voice. It's not so much about visual effects. So I, it's. The work is based on the interview I conducted with him. 
and then I shot it at a neutral buoyancy lab, which is basically a giant pool of water that astronauts used to go to learn how to um, move in outer space, but now is used for ro ro uh, space robotics. And I shot it at home. Um, oh, that's another. Uh, at home using very everyday chemicals at a micro scale to replicate some of the experiences that you hear him talk about. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm Siberia, and before I start, I just want to give one brief um, autobiographical note about myself, which is that I spent two years in walking pilgrimage with Buddhist monks, retracing the transatlantic slave trade, and I only give that bit of information because a lot of my work is basically dealing with landscape, and I'm kind of obsessed with landscape, and I basically tend to think of everything now as a landscape, meaning you are a landscape, I'm a landscape, my studio space is a landscape. I refer to my studio practice a lot as the studio, even if it's things that I'm generating. Um, and, and walking for two years in sort of like a meditative state, um, contemplating uh, you know, the cultural history of the US and America and uh, the Americas and um, the Caribbean and Africa and abroad and all basically the world. Um, it, it really makes you consider um, each parcel of land, which is something that resonated with me with Rachel's, um, with, with something that Rachel said about her own work. And I'm always constantly thinking about little centimeters of land and space and sort of the histories that are underneath. These are just some of the influences that I'm working with now. I'm thinking a lot about the color blue and it relates to my project um, in, at the Perez Art Museum. I look, I'm a very greedy artist. I make a lot of work. Um, uh, I'm, I look at fashion magazines for color and form. Can we go to the next slide? Um, I look at a lot of um, landscape-based photographs. Um, I have a huge National Geographic collection um, and I'm always contemplating and thinking about, again, what's underneath land. We can go to the next slide. Um, constantly looking at um, images from news headlines, not only for the stories underneath them, but also for um, information about how we think about color um, and form and shape we can move. Um, I'm right now researching um, a project uh, looking at all of the, the continent, the, the countries in the continent of Africa and thinking about the architectural spaces and how the architectural spaces play out outdoors. Um, this is a, a wonderful exhibition by Duru Alu, who's a, if I pronounced his name right, he's a fashion designer, also uh, sort of, I don't want to say he's a curator formally, but I do look at a lot of other, my, my project is really research-based, my entire studio practice. We can go on. I look at a lot of architectural forms I'm, I'm kind of jealous of like what most people do and I wish that I could make a lot of the work. So I'm always collecting images. Um, we can go on. Um, again, looking at architectural spaces. Um, we can move on. Um, right now I'm getting ready to, um, I've been looking at a lot of uh, the homoerotic male figure as it relates to the 1970s and 1980s and this sort of perfect male body as it relates to modern and postmodern dance um, and also uh, Jamaican daggering, which is another dance form. And I'm, um, the, the piece that I'll be doing at the kitchen actually conflates um, these gestures and, 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 and uses female bodies to sort of interact um, in, in ways that are similar to this gesture that you see here, which is from a book called Fire Island Pines. This is actually a sketch from that project that I produced as a commission from the High Line, which um, again looks at that gaze. Um, I don't, these, these are um, all stretched out, so uh, anyway, we can move forward. This is Huma Baba, who I, I just really appreciate her practice and, and someone I look at consistently. Uh, keep going. Vito Akanchi, I would say, Vito Akanchi, Yoko Ono, they are sort of some foundational figures that I really love looking at um, for the expansiveness of their practice. For Vito, for me, um, thinking about uh, poetry, then it has it relates to architecture, as it relates to, perf to performance. Um, we can keep going. Cecily Brown's color palette is, is, is stunning, is beyond stunning, and constantly influences me. 
I've traveled to Africa. I'll be going there um, in the next year or so, and I've been obsessed with Lagos, Nigeria, as a mega city, as a as a as a you know microcosm for how we think about space and and landscape um, in a more futuristic sense than I've actually engaged. I look at artist studios quite constantly. This is Leonardo Drew's studio. Can we keep going? This is Louise Nevelson, another sort of figure who I really relate to, whose, whose project I'm sort of fascinated with, with in terms of structure. Uh, keep going. Glenn Ligon. Thomas Josuego. I haven't even talked about my own work. <laughs> Paul McCarthy, another example of an artist that I actually really didn't like when I first started to engage and whose practice I now am fascinated by because there's a certain amount of freedom that I'm really trying to engage. I started out as a, uh, I worked with Stephen Shore and Anmi Lee, straightforward f four by five huge f formal training f color photographs and I'm slowly kind of trying to let go of a lot of the control that I traditionally have had in my work and, and explore a lot of freedom and mess and um, things that I'm not as comfortable with. Sheila Hicks, I will just keep going. And a Teresa de Kiersmacher, my, my project um, that I showed you the work of Fire Island Pines that I'm referencing those, um, those bodies uh, is really, it's a choreographic work. It's the first choreographic piece that I'll produce. And so I've been looking at a lot of the scores of choreographers and, and I'm use, working with dancers and filmmakers to produce that work next year. Uh, and Yvonne Rayner, we can keep going. Okay, so this is the first um, one of my projects. This is a project that was commissioned by the State Department and the Bronx Museum. Um, I was commissioned to go to Sri Lanka and work with a local um, Sri Lankan uh, contemporary arts group. And so what I did was uh, produce a series of dinners, about six dinners, and at those dinners we, we concentrated on the idea of portraiture and what's behind a portrait and also the significance of making art, uh, making a portrait or an art practice in general in a peaceful society because Sri Lanka had been in war for 30 years. So um, I wanted to think about movement, text, language, uh, sound um, and, and, and portraiture as the foundation to um, these dinner conversations that later we, we basically worked with about 30 people each dinner, 30 different people, and they presented their ideas surrounding portraiture. Um, and then I took that information, we can go to the next slide. Um, I took that information and translated into um, the three main languages, which are, which, is, which are one of the foundations of the war in Sri Lanka, which was the suppression of the Tamil language by the Sinhalese majority. Um, so I, this was the first time, according to the contemporary arts group that I worked with, was the first time that all three languages had been represented in an, a contemporary art form. So we took a lot of the information that we gleaned from the dinners, put them into text-based um, form on the walls, and built an archive of language, and then took that information, we can go to the next slide, and took it out into different part, rural areas and um, invited students to um, produce uh, photographs, portraits um, of themselves, uh, landscapes, movements, and sounds that sort of reacted and were in conversation with a lot of the projects of the elders and the conversations we can keep going. Two minutes, and Iberia. Say it again. Two minutes. Two minutes, wow. Okay, can we move forward? I'm gonna just move through. Um, can, af can, after going to Sri Lanka, I worked on a year-long project at the Museum of Ar Modern Art called Archive as Impetus. I spent a year in the archives of the museum looking for the political line throughout the museum. How does the museum collect? What um, in artist interventions have happened as a result of the politics of the museum and also um, how have unions kind of unionized or, or been active in the museum as well as how the artist collects political or how the museum collects politically. Um, and this is, this is, these are three of the works that are in the museum's collections. Um, the first one was a Felix Gonzalez Torres. This is a general idea, AIDS wallpaper. And can we go to the next slide? This is a still from A Fire in My Belly by David Wynarovich. So I took the information from the archives from the year long uh, research-based project in the archives, and you can go to the next slide. 
and presented it back to the gallery audience. Um, we basically constructed a 100-page script, and decade by decade, we went through um, and chose about three or four works or moments or movements inside of the museum. And, and basically, using the muse museum's language, gave back to the audience what works were not on view or what movements were not uh, happening at this moment that uh, were politically real, real time politics engagement. So we went from 1929, which was right when the museum was founded, to 2011, which was Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Museums, and we presented information um, concerning a lot of the works that were, um, that are part of the museum's collections in reaction to the museum. But I have, we'll have to keep going. Yeah, and later. I think, um, not to cut you off, but I think okay. we'll, as we speak about all these things, you'll be going into a lot of the other works that you've been doing. Yeah. And I think n this is a nice moment to kind of jump into this kind of methodology that you're both using. And I think it's interesting how you're both really thinking around ideas of archives and research. And I just kept thinking, as you both are talking, I was like, you're both traveling so much to find people, places to shoot, collect all this information. And it's like, as exciting as it is to travel, it's a lot of work. I was like, you could be in your studio making things and it would be so much easier. Why make it so hard on yourself? And I just wanted to kind of hear more about why work in this manner? And, and I think it's not just because we live in the so-called internet age that we can kind of mine all of this stuff, but there's something else going on because otherwise there wouldn't be that reason to be in those specific places at those certain times to do this. I, I mean, I work both in and out of the studio, so it, it's really important for me to be um, in, in the studio space actually producing photographs and um, sculptural works, which I didn't get to show. Um, and then it's also important for me to leave the studio and really, you know, think m more globally. So to try to have a both local and global kind of conversation inside of my practice. Um, well, I think for me, one of the uh, perks of the job of being an artist is that it can become a real excuse to leave what you know and to be openly curious about um, places and people that you don't know. So I very, um, I very conscientiously try to move out of myself in each work. There is this period of very much being um, interior when the edit is happening, but the moment of traveling to go to shoot, I am seeking, in a sense, connection. Seeking connection from something that was internal and subtle to something that's external and specifically grounded in, in the real world, the world outside of um, art, essentially. So that, that push back and forth within, within every work is vital to being able to make it. And I think with that in mind, you know, and maybe we could bring up some of Zyveria's slides as well so we could run through. Could we go back to Zyveria's presentation? We could maybe run through some. Because the other question I had for both of you is, why does, or how do you choose the form that your work takes? You know, Xavier, I know you're moving between performance, photography, installation, and so many different things, and how do you make those decisions? And Rachel, I know your work is primarily video, but there's also a very important installation component, and there's an important way how the, your, one's body engages with that work, and I, I don't think you really touched on that yet. Yeah, I can touch on that briefly. I didn't want to take up too much time in the, in the introduction, but, um, from the very beginning, when I begin the research process, I'm also thinking about how I would physicalize the edit. Um, and I don't mean taking things that I shot in the video and putting them in the space when you, when you are with the video, when you see it in an in a art context. I mean taking some kind of structural components of the edit and filtering through them through the apparatus of how we view something. So how light is projected, how we hear sound, where in the space our body is, what scale the projection is, how is natural light interacting with projected light. And this is different for every work and it's different for every place where the work is shown. So in a sense, the conditions of the space inform the conditions of the edit and vice versa. Um, but always maintaining it within the, the confines of the apparatus. Um, so not going too external from that. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that speak to that? 
me so, too. Yeah. yeah. And for me, it's really about how the studio practice, in, like how all of the elements inform each other. So a lot of the research, you know, for instance, what I showed the the Sri Lankan um, trip, like thinking about language and text. But I, I also construct. If you can just go through my slides, it's totally. Thank you. I also. Um, will take the research or information I glean from one practice and try to put it into the other. And I try to nurture, I feel like a, she a sheep herder. I try to nurture each practice really consistently and have a real uh, technical uh, ability with each practice. So um, if I'm working on a, on a photographic piece and I'm thinking about the history of a specific space or landscape, it's only gonna go into a text-based photograph, uh, text-based sculptural work, you can keep going a text-based sculptural work that then will sort of inform research that will later go into a performance. And it's sort of this like, what is that word, symbiosis or just like connection between materials and between um, collections and between information that really excites me. I mean, I collect, I'm collecting landscape the same way that I collect language, the same way I collect um, uh, images that will later inform performance-based works. And just to zoom out a little from there, um, just to talk about these kind of the sense of urgency, um, I think I there was a talk that um, the science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson gave once, and he said that the exciting thing when he speaks to young people is that our generation kind of has a sense of purpose in that there are kind of these impending issues, and he was speaking specifically about climate change that for our generation it wasn't a question of what do we do, but like here is a thing that we need to tackle. And I wonder for both of you, and I think to some degrees he spoke about it, but you know, is something like climate change or one of these pressing issues, is, that, is there an urgency there in order to make what you're making? I mean, I feel tremendous urgency about particularly climate change, but, um, but many issues of our time. And I find that the difficulty is understanding for myself how to approach this as an artist, again, I don't feel that my role is a political or a moral role. A role. Um, so it's in a sense a role about uh, being self-aware about my relationship to these external things that can feel so huge that you don't have a grasp on them. Or um, yeah, so always bringing it back, I think, to myself and a, a kind of personal, emotional relationship with it is, is my approach. But. And I feel, I feel both this immediate urgency to tackle certain um, things that are happening and then also to, in my own body as a, an artist um, working in the 21st century, in this particular body, I feel an, an, a, a, the same urgency to have full expression. So I'm working kind of simultaneously in like letting go of, um, I don't want to constantly kind of beat a dead horse, if that makes sense. Like I, I kind of want to show the, a full expression of a studio practice, but then I also know, like for instance, there was a piece uh, of with migrant workers, or migrants um, that are, were um, traveling mid-migration. I mean, this, the, the urgency in that work, which was commissioned by PS1, um, and that's the piece that I worked with Chris and Klaus, um, the urgency in that work had to do with first collecting images, and then it had to do with what images, it had to do with the conversation around photography first, and then it had to do with what kind of images am I interested in collecting? Okay, the images that I'm interested in collecting were, were migrants mid-migration, and then it's a conversation about how to use, how to make a, a modern photograph using only digital processes. So it's a personal thing in that I wanted to engage with um, an idea of collecting and also a pushing of my studio practice away from an analog to a digitally based pro process. But then it's also the topic, which is, which is um, illegal migration in the seas. And, and what about audience? Do you both think about who's engaging with your work? Is that something that's important? Are there people that you have in mind do you want me to ask? You go. Ahead. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to say that I think about audience really specifically. And this question brings me back to how I think about installing the work. Um, I'm thinking about the audience that will see my work in the place where I'll be showing it. 
So um, maybe I can, this is a good time to maybe just speak about how we're sure. thinking about installing our show, for example. So at the Whitney, the Whitney is located West Village, New York, between the river, looking out on one side to the river, on the other side, back internally into the city. This is a work, this video work that's dealing with um, the limits of the earth, looking at the earth from space, the earth as a kind of um, horizon, in a sense. So when, when I install the work at the Whitney, I'm thinking very much about the view from the Whitney outside back to the sun. Um, so we're installing it, hopefully, uh, with a projection going into a face of glass, and that glass faces the city, the West Village. And the idea is that at certain moments in the video, you're fully in the video, just in a kind of weightlessness of this experience of the astronaut. And at other moments in the video, you're suddenly grounded and weighted and acknowledging your own experience as yourself in that moment in the Whitney, looking at the West Village, a very earthly, earthly experience. Seeing and, out. Yes, yeah, seeing, looking out the window and in, back into the city. So it's a kind of flicker between a weighted and a weightlessness back and forth. So I'm thinking about the audience in a very specific way, their body in relationship to the video, in relationship to the room that they're in, in relationship to where that room is. It's very hard for me to think about audience in a broad spectrum, like a type of person or a type of um, knowledge base or something. So I, I think I think about it in relationship to physicality. And I think I, I, I think of audience in a m multiple different ways. One, I think of audience in terms of time. Right now, a lot of my works, they have a lot in them. I'm, I'm a collector of things. I, you, you would think I was a hoarder, but I'm not. But I'm a collector of things. Like I like, like for instance, this installation. This this performance was five hours at the Aldrich. You you saw the buildup of the the installation happening. Um, this figure right here, who is the chance operator, I called her. She literally did the same movement for five hours. She crumpled a piece of paper. Uh, different sheets of paper for five hours, the same exact movement. I'm really interested in the audience having to deal with that and deal with, um, with my text-based pieces, which are like 60 feet by 20 feet high. I'm interested in the audience thinking about language, thinking about it multilingually, having to be slightly uncomfortable and frustrated with the fact that they can't grasp it all, all at once. But at the same time, I'm also interested in the audience when they see me and they're, and they're looking at me physically and thinking about an expansive studio practice and the idea that um, as a female, as a, as a woman of color, as a woman of mixed race origins that I can um, contemplate more than just what's expected in the, in, the, in, the, in the first initial viewing of who I am as a producer. So I'm really interested in expanding that conversation and I'm also interested in the audience of myself, and that's why um, I'm very, like I said in the beginning, very greedy. Like right now, I'm obsessed with 1970s homoerotic photography. I think it's some of the most beautiful um, uh, uh, imagery that we have right now, and so I'm interested in the audience of myself and taking that in and letting myself breathe it in and really have a fascination with um, a topic that is not from, it's not so close to me. It's really important that I don't always deal with topics that are so close to me so that I can let, so that I can be porous, take it in, and then give it back out. I think that's gonna give you a very broad audience for the kitchen show. Yeah. Coming up. <laughs> um, why don't we open it up to questions in this audience? Happy? I have a, a kind of confrontational question, so I want to start out by prefacing it by saying that I really love your presentations here and your work and cannot wait to see your shows. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key concepts that's come back in both of in what both of you have said is the idea of a kind of curatorial practice, working with an archive, extracting uh, things from it and making a selection that then tells a story or creates a, a new image. Uh, this makes me think of some of the things that have gone wrong in curatorial practice, the way that Bill Rubin was criticized for misrepresenting African art and primitivism, that Hubert Martin was criticized for misrepresenting non-Western art in Médicien de la Terre. And I'm curious about your sense of responsibility to the archives you work with. Let, let me just kick this off with one example. I mean, you showed us that fascinating piece about the dinner parties 
the dinners in, in Sri Lanka, and I was thinking, of course, of the very tortured history there, the rebellion of the Tamils against the Sinhalese majority. You know, in retrospect, we look at it as a persecuted minority, but of course, the larger context is that they're adjacent to the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, and in some sense, saw themselves as a majority reclaiming power. How, how, do, how does an issue like that come into the work that you produce as an artist? Um, hmm, that's, I mean, that's such a large, complicated issue um, to, to, but I think just in Sri Lanka, in, in, with the group that I was working with, they're called Tirta, um, and they're the longest running uh, contemporary arts group in Sri Lanka. Um, the fact alone, there's a couple of, fa of, 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 of factors. There was one, this was the first time that the US government in like 15 years had commissioned visual artists to even engage um, internationally. So that was the first fact, right? And then there were the conversations that ensued between the Tamil artist and the Sinhalese artist, which were actually not happening. I'm not saying until I got there, but it was, I sort of, with the help of the US Embassy and a bunch of other resources, were, was able to facilitate conversations. Um, so we had, I learned a lot about the history of Sri Lanka, which is important for me as in, again, as an audience of myself, it, it's important for me to embody some knowledge beyond the perspective that I could have as an American artist. Um, and, um, and, also bring, and, and also thinking about language in a more abstract way, like, um, you know, bringing together three languages may seem simple to us, but in, in, in Sri Lanka, that was a really complex, to, to get um, the questions and uh, comments that we produced at those dinners translated into Tamil was literally like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Like it was difficult to translate from English to Sinhalese, then from Sinhalese to Tamil. That was like a, a, an entire, um, it was like, getting into Fort Knox. I mean, it was just, it, it, was, it was literally impossible and it was really constructive even for the, the Sri Lankan Sinhalese artists that I was working with to actually really start thinking about, um, really thinking and, and pinpointing the importance of language as the initial um, conversation that needed to happen. And then you go into portraiture, which, which has to do with the self um, and, and, and constructions of the self. So I feel like, um, I acted extremely responsibly, and I also was curtailed in certain ways because I was working with the State Department and with embassies who were watching pretty much everything that I did, and I tried to act respectfully as such. Do you have anything to say? Oh, um, I can well, I'll, I can just say that uh, in every instance, I get permission from the place. So in the case of shooting at the Glass House, I worked with them, or this astronaut, I work with him. Um, so all my major sources, I work together. Uh, they, with the intention, fully clarified on all fronts. So I don't um, abuse that that relationship, I guess. But I also don't work with archives so much. So it's a different, it's a different thing. And I think it also gives a distinction to kind of how curators work within a certain curatorial practice and how artists work with may seem to be the similar material. And I think it's a different set of responsibilities that exist, especially um, for those of us who work at institutions. You know, it's, it comes with a different set of expectations. And I think one of the amazing things for artists is that there's license to kind of misread or misinterpret in ways that you can't do in other fields or within other positions. And I think both Siberia and Rachel and the majority of artists are working in very responsible ways. But one of the amazing things is that, you know, you come into art with any which way. It's not like becoming a heart surgeon. You have to go through a certain thing, you know, that, you know, you come in with what you have and you can do what you want to a certain extent. There's a freedom to play. I will say though, there is, I, I love that you even brought up a heart surgeon because a lot of the, this is a simple um, statement, but I'm gonna say it, is that a lot of the times people still approach me and they're like, what do you do exactly? And I literally think of my practice as one would think of being a lawyer or a doctor or, or a, a, an accountant. It's something that I do consistently with, 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 with method, with, um, with a lot of research and a lot of ten attention to details. And it's very intentional, even if it looks uh, sort of not as 
crisp as you may think. It's, it's usually with complete precision and intention. Amy? Thank you. I, I'd like to echo what Pepe said. I, I'm very excited to see the shows. So you've made great presentations and absolutely um, left us all extremely curious and interested. Um, I, I think I'm curious to know, hearing your presentations, how you engage and deal with the editing process of your ideas. So both of you are maximalists, for sure. The world is infinite. I, I love the word you use, porous. It's, you know, there's just an infinite amount you can take in. So I, I always felt in the best of circumstances, and I'll say like a little bit in the old days, and you guys represent the new days, a dealer was a great editor of someone's work. If the artist allowed the dealer to play that role, and if they had, let's say, a successful and beautiful marriage of dealer and artist, that was extremely rare. I will say for the record, the best editor of all time, in my estimation, was Paula Cooper, the best dealer editor, who happened to have artists that matched her editing sensibility, and the whole thing was like beautiful and perfect. But um, who do you, is the editing done in your head only? So you're, you're both the creator and the editor. Is it the curatorial process that edits? Is there a dealer? Is there some guy in a film editing studio who you love and listen to and trust? How do you edit all of your ideas and get to some place of artistic, yeah. you know, yeah. opus, like perfectness for you? Um, okay, so I do all the editing myself. As I, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's very personal, so I don't externalize that. My works are no longer than eight or nine minutes, and it takes one year to complete. So there's a huge amount of editing that happens. Um, often, for example, there's one shot that happens for literally two frames in the video I did at the Glass House that I shot in Toledo, Ohio, that was a two-day shoot that in the end was two frames of, of the video that no one would even know is there. Um, I like to use where I shoot and what I appropriate um, exchangeably. So for example, again, the shoot at this neutral buoyancy lab uh, was a complicated shoot to orchestrate. And in the end, I used one shot from that shoot and other shots I used more expansively and those were appropriated. So I try to, to really always be coming back to the meaning of the work and be as objective as I can about my own material. So one of the ways I do that is actually through a process of intensive labeling and organizing, which can take two or three months sometimes with what I'm doing. Um, and that allows me to give a, myself a kind of objectivity to what I've shot. So for example, if I were to shoot right now and make an image of this, of, of everyone here, um, maybe I wouldn't notice someone's, uh, something about one person's shirt. But it's through the labeling process when I mark, okay, this person's wearing a pink shirt, this person's wearing a blue shirt, the light was like this, that I might notice like something like that, pick it out, and then that could actually become what the work takes form to. Um, so for me, editing is essential. If you're talking about in a larger sense, of course, working with someone like Chris is hugely grateful to because he, he has such expansive knowledge and such a sharp eye. So we have like a total dialogue and, and also the gallery I work with, I also have this relationship with. So there are different forms of editing. Yeah, and I am, it dep obviously depends on each project, but um, with, with my photographic practice, I work with printers, um, I w and, and I work with a printer and a retoucher to sort of get the ideas correct in terms of the actual editing of the works to make them to do, to bring their them to their fullest fruition. Uh, and as far as um, performances, is like this one or the Museum of Modern Art piece. The Museum of Modern Art piece I was edited. Um, with the through the education department and other bureaucratic uh, hands that I couldn't even see um, for a year, pretty much every day I was in conversation with the museum. Every day, I mean, I gained 20 pounds that I'm now still losing because I was I was extreme. It was amazing, but I had never I had never had that much. Um, intervention into my studio practice, right? So ev I scripted the whole thing. It was a 100-page script that came from the archives, you know, that I 
culled information from the archives. And then that was a conversation that happened consistently every day for a year. So that's one way of editing. And then I do work with galleries. That's, that's another conversation. And then, I mean, there's, there's, every, there's so many hands in, in my work, even though, again, like this may look as free flowing as possible. And the fact that I produce, I produce a lot of work, but it's consistently in conversations, not only with people inside of my studio, but also outside factors and museums and curators um, at my park. So I think we have time for Donna. We have time for two more questions. So we can do Donna and then Aggie. Um, I also agree with Peppy and Amy. It's very exciting what you're doing. It's exciting to hear what's going on in the world of young and up and coming artists. Siberia, you mentioned some of the artists that you admire that you've been collecting. Rachel, I'd love to know some of the artists that have influenced you. Totally. Um, well, a big influence for me, actually, it wouldn't necessarily be obvious in what I make, but it's an artist who was a mentor of mine and also who I worked for, and that's Rick Kurt here of Venetia. Um, and, uh, part, oh, so I can describe, well, so Rick Kurt here of Venetia, um, and uh, many artists actually of his generation, so um, people who were thinking, I guess to summarize it in a broad sense, um, maybe more about a way of seeing and organizing material than about, um, a attachment to the tool or the material itself. Um, and, and, and so I would say that this generation, strongly Rick Crit, um, and other artists like Philippe Perino's relationship to film um, have, have definitely influenced me. And then I guess in terms of a, a sense of a new documentary, someone like Karun Faruqi um, and uh, Chris Marker, these, these kinds of figures in post-structuralist film from that side. And for the Whitney piece, definitely thinking about Robert Irwin um, and how he, in his relationship with the scrims, was in a sense, for me, physicalizing a film edit within space and light. So also some light and space um, EAT people. I think we've had a lot of conversation with Irwin and thinking around this notion of conditional art, which is not just site specific, but also kind of deals with kind of the container and kind of the space, but then also the phenomenon that's around the physical space yeah. as well. Thank you all Thank for you. joining Thank us. You.